Mm. All right, Mr. Go Irmoto. Good afternoon, <laughs> sir. Hey, good afternoon. Thank good you so much for joining us today. I super appreciate it. Um, you and I have chatted quite a lot before, and um, uh, it's always an amazing time to have a conversation with you in terms of how thorough you are with the work that you do. And I want to give people a sense of what they're in for today. I think that they're in for an incredible <laughs> ride. Um, and uh, there's a, I'm going to show a clip in a second here so people can see what exactly I'm talking about. But um, we're really talking about prep today. There's a lot about your talents, a lot about things that you do um, that I think are just absolutely outstanding in terms of your whole process and your whole creative process. But, um, you know, I want to give people a sense too when we were talking about prep. This is how prepared Go Moto is for a live stream. You sent me like this incredibly like detailed list you know of uh of everything and uh it's the most prepared anyone's ever been for a live stream i'm super impressed um so it, when people see what i'm going to show them in a second and they see the amazing images that you get a lot of that comes down to how well prepared you are how when you're going into these shoots you have a really good idea of what to expect how are you going to manage those expectations? Um, and the reason why I think this conversation is really important for all creators, whether you're video or still, is because I think that for especially a lot of people in the filmmaking community, if you come up through traditional channels, like you go to film school, you get an internship at a production company, you start as a second AC and you work your way up, by the time that you get into a position of authority, creative authority, um, you kind of know everything already. Like you've seen it all done the same way a thousand times. So, you know, you're already ready for what's to come. But if you're like someone like myself, for example, who, you know, had a little bit of experience in, you know, the back end of filmmaking, but mostly was a self-starter. I was like, I'm just going to shoot things and like make things. Um, you spend a lot of time doing a lot of inefficient things <laughs> until you learn the hard way that that's not the way you do things. Um, and so what I hope for today, for everybody watching, is that you can walk away from this live stream immediately and immediately change the way you make content, change immediately the way that you create art and make it more efficient, make it resound more with people. So that's what I hope. I'm going to stop talking and we're going to start go with um, uh, a video of yours. This is just a teaser for The Wonder. Do you want to set this up for us really quick? Uh, yeah, well, thanks for that intro, Dale. Um, so this teaser here is for a short film we did a couple of years ago called The Wonder. Uh, which was shot in Kenya in Africa. Um, and it was shot with, it's one of my personal projects versus commercial. It was shot with two people, myself, my wife being the sort of the main crew. And then we had some guides and drivers over, over in Kenya. But um, it was a good example of sort of combining uh, the, the human storytelling I like to do with the nature, adventure, travel, wildlife part. Um, so yeah, here it is. A here we go. Teaser, 60 seconds. Oops. Let me, uh, do this. This is not, this is, there we go. Nature and the beauty of the wilderness is far, far greater than us.
I gotta say that you give Emmanuel Lubezki a run for his money on those things, man. <laughs> That's pretty incredible stuff. So uh, let's talk through this a little bit. Tell us, uh, the audience, to hear a little bit about your situation. You mentioned that your 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 wife, your partner, um, as a filmmaking team. Um, you also mentioned that you know a lot of these projects that we're going to talk about today and show examples from and show the behind the scenes and all the gear that you use and how you use it. With all these projects, the thing that's mostly synonymous is that it's a very small crew. It's mostly yourself and a handful of people. So talk about the style in which uh, your sort of your filmmaking is couched in. Yeah, so I think um, uh, I should sort of give a bit of background to the fact that I'm, I kind of consider myself a director and cinematographer. Um, and that kind of started off with sort of the early days, which I think a lot of people can relate to when you pick up a camera yourself and you kind of just shoot stuff. And at that point, I didn't even know there was even a division between director and cinematographer. You're just kind of shooting and creating stuff as you're going. Um, but over time, you know, the division started to become apparent, but I like the idea of doing both. And today, where I'm at today as sort of mainly a commercial director, um, I do do jobs where I work with other DPs. Uh, those would be like more traditional, bigger ones, which end up being hybridized to the way I work anyway. Uh, but then a lot of the personal projects and now creeping into the commercial world is this sort of approach of documentary style, which is why I got into filmmaking from the beginning anyway. And as Dale, Dale mentioned earlier, I didn't go to film school myself. So I was, you know, I was sort of that typical guy who, bought a camera or picked up a camera, um, I had a laptop and I just sort of shot and pasted, cut and pasted things together. And that was really the beginnings. Um, I thought that, you know, Dale, you and I talked about like what topic to, to talk about. And we talked about prep as sort of uh, a venue to talk about the way I work. Um, it's one thing that I do in, you know, and all like we could be talking about camera work and how to interact with people. And there's so many layers to the way that I shoot, but prep is something I haven't really talked about. And it's kind of interesting because I do find that it kind of, uh, does represent, um, how I do my work philosophically on, on a, like a larger scale, I guess. And so one of the things that I've discovered, and I used to be a little bit um, almost embarrassed about the way I worked because when I would see the big traditional companies and I knew that there was sort of a certain way to do things, um, I didn't feel like I was doing those. And now I think I'm a little bit more confident in saying, hey, this is the way I do things and, and that's okay. Uh, so today I've got a collection of photos that I've never really shared before and, you know, how I pack my bags to case studies of some of the films that I've worked on. Um, and I think I want to show them because to show that it's okay to do things the way you want to or the way you've discovered works and don't feel the need to uh, fit into a mold of what's traditional. I think it's good to know the basics and I think those work and there's a reason why it works, but it's also okay to sort of discover yourself um, is one thing that, uh, that I thought would be useful for this. And, and when we talk about prep, I mean, prep can mean a lot of things, especially if you're hybridized like you are, and you're a director and a DP. So typically a DP has their own type of prep and then a director has their own type of prep uh, and everybody else too. So when we talk about preparing, can you kind of encapsulate what preparing for you looks like, all the sort of the different elements? Yeah, so uh, that's a great point because um, it's it's is, as much as I am a bit of a gearhead, uh, and a lot of the photos that I'll show will pertain to that. Um, it's prep isn't just about your gear and cameras and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot more prep on the other hand on the director side of things. So. When it comes to the canoe, for instance, it's contacting all the people that we worked with ahead, from months ahead of time. Uh, this project that you just saw, The Wonder in Africa, uh, is, again, months and months and months of planning, um, getting to know the story ahead of time. You don't just land. So I, I, I guess that's a really good point, actually. You know, because I do, you know, a lot of people would frame what I do as like documentary style or run and gun style. That really doesn't mean just showing up on set with a camera and just winging it. Um, th yes, there is a fluidity and sort of embracing moments and naturalism when you're there on set, but there's a lot of preparation that comes around it. So the analogy that I like to use is sort of like if there were to be like a box, um, 
really, really preparing everything uh, for that box. Uh, so everything from even the wardrobe that they're going to wear um, so they don't show up wearing wacky stuff. Um, you know, what you want to kind of basically loosely do so that you don't show up and you just have to scratch your head and you realize you wanted to paddle, um, a certain paddle, you know, um, so you prep and prep and prep and you make sure that the timing works. So you get your sunrises and your sunsets and everything. Um, and then when you get there, then you can kind of let loose and run around like a playground, but it's building that playground, I guess, or a box to play in, um, that's where the preparation comes. And, and again, it's not just the gear. It, it, there is a very sort of, um, yeah, structural element to it from, from a storytelling perspective. Um, I do want to sort of, thanks for sharing the scenes from the canoe there. Um, I did want to sort of, I, I, you know, as much as I did want to sort of not talk about gear, but, or I mentioned gear, <laughs> gear is not a thing, but I did want to sort of, if it's okay to screen share, Dale, yeah, I, wanted to, I wanted to start off showing, uh, let me just figure this out here. Um, uh, sorry, start sharing some, some sort of the evolution of gear prep. Um, and, uh, just as a starting point, because I think this table here, uh, a lot of people might be able to relate to, um, and sort of different variations of packing. This is just sort of an example of, of how I've prepped and, and traveled with my gear and tr travel doesn't necessarily mean international. This is sort of the way. So back in the day, I used to use a lot of these mech duffel bags, um, and I would uh, I would put put sort of low pro bags or other types of bags inside of them, um, and then eventually I evolved to to hard cases. Um, and you could see my OCD ness uh, <laughs> coming in and, and inside the hard. And if cases. I can ask a quick question, give us a sense, just you know, based on the luggage that we're looking there. Um, yeah. You know, what's the dialogue with the airline? Like, is there any things <laughs> that people need to know about traveling with that much uh, equipment other than be prepared to pay a lot of overage fees? Uh, yeah, well, that's so, yeah, it, it kind of ranges all over the place. So um, most of the time you I've been lucky enough to have like the client or the project funding to to cover it um, or that we take it into account. Um, in other times, uh, you know, by now, like we're also lucky to have certain like what do you, flight, what do you, what do you call it, reward or statuses that can help accommodate for those. But you know, a, and a good example is like last year we flew to Africa with ten cases, and because of the the weird flight, um, I forget what it's called when it's like a different carrier. Even though you anyway, our our status didn't work, and and we got nabbed three thousand dollars right off the top um, unexpectedly for baggage fees, and 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 uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was a lot of. Uh, discussions with the airline staff but uh they didn't budge so so yeah it's just a mixed bag but it is it is part of what you have to do and and is um is every time you take a flight with that much gear is it different every time is it different based on the destination that you're going in the airlines that you work with or is it pretty predictable like you can sort of go okay we're going here this is what we do it's going to be the same same expectations how much how variable is that experience yeah, well, it, it's every time it's different. Like, um, and in terms of prep, like having it call airline companies ahead of time was is always, or even at least going on their websites to see, especially if you have like multiple different care, uh, flight companies on your on your way to somewhere. Um, security was a big thing, so you've got to know your battery regulations, which is a big thing. And most security. Uh, you know, uh, staff and employees don't really know the certain regulations, which under 100 watts, uh, or, um, you're kind of allowed to have unlimited amount of carry on batteries. And, uh, and then it kind of changes uh, between 100 and 160 watt max. Right. Um, so, yeah, I've had times where like a security employee had to call the pilot of the airplane to make sure it was okay. And we've had, and then different countries have different battery number regulations. So you, you go through a lot to up to the point where some people don't, don't seem to mind at all and don't even look through your bags. But, um, but that, that is a good part of the preparation and, and sort of because, you know, you lose all your batteries and then that's your job is gone. And, um, cool. I'm going yeah, to keep, I'm gonna keep, let's keep going. 
Yeah, and that and that is a big part of like like this slide here is sort of our living room, which again, my wife is very generous and 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 kind to let me or let I guess for us to take over because the other thing, um, this is her on the right, and this is my one of my other key assistants and grips and gaffers and ACs, Abe Roberto. He's incredible. Um, he started from the photo world, which helped with sort of this doc style, run and gun working, I suppose. Um, but one of the keys, like this photo here of our room, this this is what it ends up looking like for about two to three weeks, sometimes more, uh, before a project. Um, and that's sort of to give you an idea of how long um, it takes to prep um, for a project. And going back to that airline thing, you know, I think it's kind of um, important to, uh, I'm just going to stop screen sharing for a sec here, to, to sort of, I guess, be mindful of every little detail because, you know, everything from when you're going on the plane and you want to make sure you have everything, you want to make sure everything is neatly organized. Like you saw in one of the slides, I numbered my cases just to make sure that I can keep count easily and that the people, you know, maybe if someone's meeting us on the other end, um, you know, all these little things. And so I do get a little OCD about it, but I've found that organization uh, when you're a small team, especially, is is super important, and it and it helps quite a lot um, in 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 sort of the thing. The the other thing you might have noticed, which I used to be pretty embarrassed about, is how much I'll I'll actually cram quite a lot. Um, so you know, for instance, like uh, typical sort of rental house kits come like you'll have like a small little something with a pelican case the size of you know a giant rubbermaid bucket um and i totally get it and i understand you want to be mindful and protective um but when it comes to trying to be efficient uh i do find that that sort of is counterintuitive to it so i'll find different ways to pack and admittedly i've had gear that gets scratched or does get bent and stuff but um, to me, the benefit outweighs the cost. So I'll find ways to sort of pack more efficiently. Um, and that sort of comes about, you'll see later on, because when you're traveling with gear, you know, you, you'll know like when you're going through planes or cars or boats or whatever it is, um, that goes through there. I wonder, um, before we continue, just so people feel heard, we've got a question from the, the live chat. Um, and I just wanted to, to quickly address this because I think it also fits in a little bit here. Uh, it is from Ray Chang. Uh, Ray says, hey, big fan of Go's work. The Canoe is such a beautiful, inspiring film. And he asks, was it a passion project? And how long did it take from prep to post? Ah, uh, great question. Thanks so much, Ray. Um, so it was sort of a hybrid of a passion project and a client-based one. So I'd been filming for Ontario Tourism for years at this point. We shot the canoe in 2016. Um, and there came a point where I'd become good friends with the client and him and I were at a, the, uh, the Real Paddling Film Festival down in Toronto at the Royal Theatre. And we were like, we got to do a film about canoeing. And I'd been a canoe, like a canoeist or paddler since I was seven. Uh, loved all the Bill Mason films, and I we had done two previous outdoor films um, with Ray Mears, who's like sort of a British survivalist uh, woodsman celebrity. And it it came, you know, it just came time. It just naturally came about that like we got to do a film about canoeing. It's sort of a love letter to the canoe, and he kind of turned it into a campaign for Ontario tourism, and therefore was able to get me funding and. It was neat. It wasn't much. It was like an indie film budget. Uh, we filmed for about two weeks uh, in August uh, 2016, and I prepped for, again, two, three weeks. At the time, we had a little studio by the junction, but that picture you saw of the living room, it kind of looked like that for three weeks. Um, and it was constant testing, testing, testing. And the next part you'll see, is, which is kind of going through my camera rig evolution, you'll see what I mean by testing, 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 like every little meticulous part. Um, I had to sort of tweak to, to, to kind of envision the shots I wanted. Um, and then I think for post, I mean, it was a long period, but we pretty much, it was Courtney, my wife and I, who edited that one. We spent about three, four months kind of slowly editing it together and we released it in January of that following year. Um, so yeah, that kind of gives you a bit of the timeline. It's pretty uh, amazing because, you know, with a lot of filmmakers, when we're doing projects, and we're really excited about it, we're like excited to get them out. 
You know, we want to be like, okay, it's a shot. Let's get it out. We're, you know, we don't want it this to become stale. We want it to like sort of move mountains. So like the sooner it's out, the better. But what I take away from what you just said is number one is for something, you know, like that you shot here with a very small budget, the fact that the amount of prep that you did, like three weeks of prep is a lot more than I actually would have thought, you know, three weeks of sort of dedicated prep, but also how long it took you in post that you didn't rush it through. You, you kind of worked together at it over time until you were really happy with it. So I think it's almost like the patience of the long game is mostly what's important to creating really stellar work to some degree. Uh, yeah. Like I, again, like I'll, give full credit to partially my OCD, but also my, like, I do have like a little knick knack for perfectionism, I suppose, even though like I realize there's other examples of perfection, but I, I get really nitpicky. Um, I also have, you know, uh, like this sort of, I don't know, insecurity, I guess, of sharing work. So like, Instagram post is a good example. Like, I feel like someone like you, Dale, could just whip up a post in like five minutes. For me, it's like an hour of excruciating pain just to like make sure is that right? Is it the right tone? Is that right? And you know, well, there's I'll nothing at over. stake for me, so it's <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> yeah, but but I think the release of the works I do is a good kind of uh, example of that. Like nothing I've done I could think of has just you know, and like Lure of the North. Funny enough, like we shot that in twenty. Uh, 16, 17. I actually shot the first part of Lord of the North before the canoe, and we only released it last year. Um, and that's a combination of like getting busy with other stuff and letting it, you know, drag, but also not feeling this sort of like urgency to get it done because I was constantly kind of trying to find the right tone and perfection of it, um, which is this next film here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so. Uh, Dale, if it's cool, I'm going to kind of segue into yeah, the camera rig thing because, again, it's just a, kind of a symbol. I guess it's like a tangible symbol of, of the kind of the prep mentality that, that I have, which is sort of the way that I like to work. And again, like even for commercial jobs, you know, you and I were talking earlier that there's sort of like this one day um, prep kind of thing, but uh, I actually kind of do more prep it if I can, like even location scouting. I, I try to buy time whenever I can. And, and so even scouting, I'll try to stretch it as long as I can, you know, given the budget and camera gear prep, I'll usually kind of either sneak my way into the camera house, rental houses, or some of the team or the crew or the DP and uh, beforehand. But, um, you know, one of the things I do, this is me on a Movi rig, um, because I'll, you know, I switch from a movie to handheld, I'll make sure like myself and my team could do so super quick and you kind of pre-rig the camera to make it swappable. Um, but going back in time, like, you know, this is me over 10 years ago. <laughs> um, like a and, little baby there. And I know, I know. <laughs> uh, and I've got like a 5D Mark II with, you know, some, I don't know, janky follow focus thing or whatever. Uh, but I remember like I would have, you know, spent time making sure this rig was the one I needed for this little job I did. And, you know, over time it evolved. I think this is my first Scarlet I had and I had like a little Zakuto eyepiece. And this is the one of the films I did with Ray Mears for Ontario Tourism. Probably one of my first early ones where I was outdoors on my own, um, with just the red camera rig, which everyone probably, a lot of people know it's not the easiest uh, in sort of uh, outdoor remote situations for media and battery and everything. Um, and it just kept sort of evolving. Uh, this is another one I did in Algonquin. And you can kind of see here the basic kit I had, which is fairly simple. Um, uh, this is kind of a telephoto kit I have in Africa. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, I, this is like a Sigma 150 to 600 or a 60 to 600. Uh, and then the rig just kind of kept evolving. Um, the handles, you know, I got that from uh, a Mad Max behind the scenes that I saw where they called it the V-Rig. So some of their stunt shooters um, would have would have this sort of, uh, these are just red rock handlebars on, on the rig. And then I started bringing in my own follow focus device, which, you know, I remember going to White's and it's kind of, this is one of the things I was embarrassed to sort of showcase, but I'm sort of somewhat 
okay with now. It's just a little ICANN, a couple hundred dollar um, wired fellow focus. And I find it quite handy and I find it quite efficient for, for what I do. Um, uh, I also tend to, <laughs> I don't ever show these on Instagram, but um, I'll do selfies because a lot of the times when I'm working with people, um, I'll, I'll want to sort of have a sense of what I look like. Uh, I work with real people a lot, so I want to be aware of what my presence looks like. Uh, you know, I, I've worked with like Sony Venice and Alexa, even mini sets that are two, three times the size. And it, I, I do feel like with real people or documentary settings, it just has a different presence, not, you know, let alone the mobility of the camera. Um, and then, uh, you know, even underwater rigs, I've, I've worked on documentaries like The Cove or Shark Water uh, shooting um, uh, and just constant, constant testing to make sure like underwater rigs, especially once you're in the water, you're, you, you can't change anything. So even like the weighting and the chiclets um, to make sure that it's weighted properly uh, are kind of important things that you just constantly, constantly testing, 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 prepping, prepping, prepping to be mindful of. Um, I've got a video clip here. This is sort of like, I just did a job for a hospital, um, in Toronto and this is sort of the latest rig. And I was kind of showing that I, I made this video cause I was sending it to my, my AC gaffer grip, Abe, um, because I was, I was quite proud, proud of it and how small I was able to get it for how much is in there. You know, I've got a microphone now attached. Um, I've got a Teradek Bolt uh, 3000 that's built in to the backside there. I've got a mixer, I've got my follow focus. And I know this is all techie, but I, I did love how small and compact this was for high quality of it was. And this is a combination of years and years and years and days and days and days of tweaking and perfecting and customizing. And, you know, when I mentioned that I would sort of prep for weeks, uh, a lot of that's just sort of trial and erroring of parts. Um, so, you know, I would be uh, like, I'd, I'd get like a small rig part or, or whatever part accessory I can to make sure that everything fits. And, and, and that's sort of the mentality, like it's sort of different to that one day prep day that you go to an odd, you know, uh, a camera rental house. And then, you know, there was a funny meme I saw the other day, you go on set and the sound guy comes and then he just puts loads your camera with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, if you have a sound guy, you know, and so, so, and then you end up with this rig that's all wires hanging everywhere and you don't know what's where, what's what and all this stuff. And, and, you know, I, I find that quite hard, especially in these sort of personal projects and documentary settings. And I saw a great, um, Instagram live or FaceTime live that the CSC ran with Iris, uh, and Nick Depensier, who are both doc shooters and, it was reinfor it was good reinforcement to hear how they talked about um, how they both have a similar mentality of a rig that they own and operate, you know, for the most part, that they've just turned into an extension of their own arm. Right. And uh, actually uh, I, I wanna ask a question based on this because you know, you make a really great case for owning your own kit. There's a lot of debate these days, especially with changing technology. Should you just buy lenses and then constantly rent the, you know, the, the camera and so on and so <coughs> forth. Um, and definitely what I've noticed from my peers is that the ones that do own their own kit, uh, they seem to be a lot more efficient. Like they seem to have it tricked out in the, the right way that works really well for them. They don't stress about it on set versus when they're picking something up from the rental house, they're like, oh, we're missing this and we need that. And why isn't it, why isn't the menu doing this thing? Um, yeah. Because you don't just work with your own kit and you do oftentimes have to work with rental kits, are there parts of your own system, whether it be that little fall focus or other things that you recommend people always own and that they adapt to whatever kit that they're renting? Or what's your thought on rent versus buy? Yeah, no, it's a good point because, yeah, I did mean to kind of flag that, like, you know, I'm not trying to, to promote that you have to be a buyer of your own gear by, by any means. I mean, again, everything I'm saying has worked for me and it sort of seems to be the way that I've done it. And if you can learn from it, great. Um, and I realize that, like, rent, you know, owning your own gear is, is tough. The, the benefit I've had for sure is how well I got to know it and how well, um, how much time I've been able to gain to, to test and prep. Um, and, and, you know, that's benefited me, you know, boot, bootload, like a, a ton. Um, 
But if you were to have pieces of gear, I think it would differ for a lot of people. I mean, to be honest, myself personally, I think uh, an easy rig would actually be one of, I don't know why I would instinctively top pop in, which is actually not part of the camera itself. Um, but it's a piece of equipment that I use quite a lot. And I find when I travel or when I use rental house ones, um, I don't know, it's just something that I would like to be a bit more personalized. Uh, the other stuff I think you can kind of, I, I can, I can kind of get away with depending on, on what I'm shooting. I noticed that you use the, um, the easy rig a lot with, looks like you have the serene arm on it as well. Um, you know, how much do you, like all the BTS photos, basically you, with, which is like 90% of every DP is BTS photos these days is with them with a easy rig or a ready rig or something. Um, but how often do you find you're using that, especially I would imagine on long shoots where you don't want to just be holding the camera all the time. It can get exhausting. Do you have a metric for how you decide when the ready rig or the, sorry, the easy rig is right for you for a project? Um, I think, yeah, I've never like consciously thought it but now that I think about it definitely subconsciously so because again I'm often directing uh, at the same time the easy rig lets me not have to worry about you know it, it almost feels like I'm not operating for a bit and or I can use one arm to to talk to the person or interact um, but it but it really depends yeah like I think if I know it's I guess it's twofold if I know I'm going to be shooting for a long time I put it on and then if I know that I have to interact with someone I put it on um, uh, but the times that I do consciously take them off are when I want to run around a certain way uh, so when I want to get into like a wide angle you know Emmanuel Lubezki ass sort of on my knees um, I often take it off because it's hard to get low and it's hard to kind of get that energy and running around I'll take it off too awesome um, but yeah so I'm just gonna kind of pipe through here uh, some just a couple more like behind the scenes I suppose of certain projects um, and I'll, I'll, I'll blast through the, this next one here is of from the canoe I mean uh, there's nothing to uh, this is the camera rig that I had for the canoe. Um, I, uh, this is sort of the, the type of gear that we had at the time. Like you could see, it's like all mishmash of different cases, but uh, a lot of soft cases, which actually is not so bad for small planes and certain things. And um, there's the easy rig again, <laughs> loaded up. Um, and that's just a look at a Barren Canyon. So. I kind of I'll pipe through this because I think I kind of mentioned most of the points of the canoe. But the next one uh, is Lure of the North, which you played a small clip of earlier on, and uh, super lucky and grateful that this actually was able to receive a Vimeo staff pick uh, last year. Um, so what was neat about this in terms of prep was, was this was actually the first project I shot using a gimbal. I had a Letus Helix Junior at the time. And the Letus Helix Jr. is not meant to be on an easy rig. It's not rigged for it. So if you could see, there's a sort of, um, I made myself a little pulley system with uh, like a, a, a rope that kind of went from handle to handle to kind of get rid of that axis so I could carry it. Um, this is one of the assistants, Jay Kraus. Uh, we just did test after test after test. Um, and just spent a lot of time testing. Um, I actually even, you know, and I was kind of inspired by the Revenant. Um, I even went to Hyde Park one day on my own and I just sort of walked around in the woods. Um, so are you seeing this Dale? Just the, yeah. Um, I spent a whole afternoon on my own, just going to Hyde Park, uh, getting random stuff. Um, then I spent another weekend after making some tweaks and modifications, filming my dad. Um, and you'll kind of see that, like I was getting inspired by the long takes as well as the, um, uh, really close wide angle shots of people from the Revenant, uh, uh, which is something I, I kind of still take on, but, um, yeah, like I've never really showed this stuff. I never thought I'd really was worth posting, but um, it was really interesting. That's my dad. <laughs> uh, interesting experiment. And these are the things that I did, like, you know, uh, in preparation for a project like Lure of the North. I didn't just whip my gimbal on and go. I, 
I really spent, and every time I would shoot something like this, I would realize a list of things that were not working for me. So I would go back to the drawing board and make tweaks and I would, you know, and tweaks are like little things like, you know, the cabling, like I didn't like the way the cable got in the way, the HDMI cable from my small HD monitor got in the way and, you know, every, every little thing um, I just sort of did. And you know, maybe it's not necessary, maybe it's over the top, but for some reason I like doing it, it makes me feel comfortable. And now when I'm actually shooting and I'm out in the middle of, you know, Northern Ontario in minus 10 degrees weather, um, I don't have to worry about all that stuff. And I can just focus on the story and the shooting and play in my playground that I mentioned earlier. Um, the other thing about prep, I guess, is not just your camera gear, but also especially for any outdoor kind of guys is is like your actual gear so a lot of dps or shooters will talk about good running shoes or good clothing um if you're outdoors uh, you know you want to have like you know layers or, or whatever it is suited for that environment and climate so we each had to pull one of these toboggans that weighed about 300 400 pounds each uh which is a mix of camera gear and and clothing food tent all that kind of stuff um this box, this wooden box, in the, is sort of what you can access. Um, uh, and so I would have to rig, you know, prepare so I could do my non-gimbal rig, like my handheld rig that would fit in it, um, <laughs> which would look like that. That's the only thing you can kind of really access when you're on the go. So again, that put prep to a whole new challenge of, you know, I can only take a certain amount of gear, I can only fit a certain amount uh, in a small space and that sort of changed my mentality of things. But again, had I not prepped and I showed up and that was what I was limited to, I, I think it would have been a gong show. Um, and so I guess that's the other thing with prep is, is doing your best to prepare for, to, to avoid gong shows. <laughs> um, cause these are the conditions that you're in, um, where you're having to go through. And if I can just ask one quick question about that, um, in this particular environment, which is very applicable to a lot of us Canadian, you know, artists, uh, we're working with technology in very harsh conditions. In this particular case, in your case, it's the harshest it just about gets. Um, what kind of uh, testing or precautions did you have to figure out or have to make when considering the the, the temperatures, the access? to gear, things like that? Like, how did you work all that out in advance? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a couple surprises for sure, but I basically just reached out to people uh, who had shot uh, and asked them. And so a condensation was a big thing that obviously came up uh, when you're going from like a warm tent to outdoors or vice versa. Um, so, you know, one of the tips was to seal your, your gear in plastic bags and suck the air out or Ziploc bags. So I did a lot of that, but didn't always work and you're always kind of in and out. But, um, I lost like three Anton Bauer batteries on that project, which is pretty painful. Just because <laughs> yeah. the extreme cold just killed them. Yeah. And the con, I think it was the condensation to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's the other thing too, like with the way that I work and owning gear, um, I, 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 you know, you take hits when you do and you just have to, to, to accept it. But, um, Oh, the other good note about prepping is taking spare gear. Um, I've had, I did a job where, um, the battery mount, the, the Anton, the gold mount battery mount on my red conked out. And luckily I had brought a spare, um, so part of all those pellies you see is that I do kind of tend to bring spare parts and pieces so you can kind of jerry rig or, or be able to shoot. Cause you know, and I, and I have, it's, again, it's that balance of like, you could take everything or do you take certain things and, and that kind of thing. But, um, yeah, especially when you're out remote, especially when you're out in extreme weather, whether it's dust in Africa or cold in Northern Ontario or Canada, um, that's definitely something that saved my ass. Cables, spare cables. Uh, I usually take two or three of every cable I have. Uh, and same with power sources and stuff like that too. So yeah, I think cables are, yeah. I, I learned that the hard way. When I first started, I was doing a shoot in the winter just here in Toronto and it was really, really cold. And I had a fairly thin HDMI cable and I was in my pocket <laughs> Um, and I put it out on a bench and it was out on the bench for like 10 minutes or whatever and we were outside and I went to plug it in and as I go to plug it in, it like just snapped in half <laughs> and I was like, well, I guess I don't have a monitor today, <laughs> you know, so it's like, yeah. you should know that obviously the environment has, you know, have 
backups, but also know what the environment's going to present to you. So anyways, I'm going to let you keep going. Cool. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, and like, I, I don't know, I really want to put emphasis in this like prep stuff, like in that two, three weeks, like, you know, over the years, I, I've just been building and building and building these kits. So like, when you saw that Pelican case early on with the softies inside, you know, one of them is all my spare parts and, you know, it's taken various forms. And now I'm at a, finally, I'm at a place where I can kind of take a sort of a template kit and, and kind of go. Um, but prior to that, it was constant building upon building upon. And even now, like every shoot, I'm usually kind of making tweaks to it. Um, and, and it's just sort of part of that process to, 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 to be kind of as bulletproof as possible when you're, when you're doing these kind of projects. Um, the next slide here um, is from a project I did in Japan. And it's actually the first sort of like commercial project I guess I'll be showing you guys. Um, it's for Sapporo, the beer company. It was a Canadian agency. Uh, it was North America, Sapporo, Canada, and USA. Wanted to do stories in Japan in a very human documentary style. And so I was super honored to be able to sort of take on this project. The client has never done. I was super nervous to do like a very, you know, they've traditionally done like very big mega productions. Um, and here I am now working with these sort of um, indigo uh, dye makers in Japan with this small kid. And here I chose not to wear an easy rig because I was running around at this point. Um, and this was kind of cool because it was sort of the beginning of this small compact kit. You could see that my Teradek transmitter was still outside the body, but um, it was being able to use sort of like a cinema rig and this size was big. And it was also one of the first jobs I'd done where I'd switched to these Pelican cases in packing, uh, which was inspired actually by another great DP, Stuart Cameron, um, who's been doing some great work lately. And he actually operates in a very similar way. So I learned a lot from him. Um, you could see that the hard cases did much better for packing, um, even the littlest details of just having the locks on the bags that are, uh, I think, I forget what it's called, but the airplane, airplane and security guys have access to opening them if they need, uh, but they're still pretty safe. Um, and then uh, just, you know, you could see sort of what our crew size kind of looks like. Um, this is a very simple setup and rig um, that I had the tools to do. Uh, I hadn't really pre-thought this when I was in Canada, but I brought a quasar um, a, a bicolor light tube and my assistant Abe is actually holding it up, holding it up on a boom. Uh, and I'm just doing a, a gimbal shot, and this is what it looks like in, in the final story that we did. This is a Johnny, sort of a rockabilly artist in Japan. Um, so with such simple, sparse gear, you could get a really, really kind of a cool, beautiful cinematic frame. Um, and this is sort of the crew. <laughs> uh, the crew that I had, you could see how good fun. And there was a few other people with us, but this is what it took. Uh, to do a big campaign. Um, and kind of just two other videos to show. Um, I'll start with this one here when it comes to prep. Um, so this is my wife and some of our crew. Um, and they're actually styling the beer. And the story behind this one, which is kind of funny, is that um, uh, we had a beer stylist. We had we had about a ten day shoot for this, and again, I, I always try to buy time whenever I can. And um, uh, um, the beer stylist we had for a few days or one or two days of the shoot, but we didn't end up having them for for the entirety of the shoot. And this one day we need to do stuff. We had to rely on our own team to to do all the the, the hero beer shots and. What ended up happening was the night before, you know, we were in the hotel room watching YouTube videos on how to style beer and make the foam. Uh, yeah, this is a commercial. So you'll see a beer shop pop up. And um, uh, it was actually, yeah, it was it was the ingen ingenuity of, of Courtney and uh, Toru, our, our kind of our production coordinator, manager, everything guy in Japan who was able to figure it out to get the sh that shot right there that you just saw. Um, the two of them worked hard at it. And, you know, uh, that meant prepping <laughs> the night before in a hotel room with chopsticks and straws and all sorts of gadgets to do it. Um, and then this last video clip here is just sort of uh, how we filmed the all the concert scenes. And, you know, this is really cool because, yes, like, you see me with the camera rig and the weeks of preparation and modifying the camera and all the blah, blah, blah. But then 
you see all the people and stage and like everything else aside from my me with the camera took weeks and weeks and weeks to prep you know um it wasn't just sort of like they all showed up and everything was good and dandy i mean this was a fake concert that we put on even finding johnny took took weeks um and so that's how that kind of could apply in a commercial setting um uh, before we break into uh some other stuff here oh i'm gonna come back um yeah is we got two questions from the feed, so I thought we'd answer those really quick. Uh, one is from Facundo, and Facundo says, "Fantastic stuff." Was there a reason that a toothbrush was in the easy access box in the Lure of the North shot? Um, was it to scrub something off, or just to keep minty fresh breath? <laughs> that is a good eye. Uh, where is this toothbrush that I'm gonna? Oh, oh, uh, yeah, no, that was to keep minty fresh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one more question uh, from uh, Micus Works. Uh, what type of locks do you use for the airplane transportation on the Peli cases? Do you, uh, you that's a good question. You know what? I, I think I got those from B and H. Um, sorry, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a whole combo set. I, I, I honestly don't remember the name. But if you look up any generic airport uh, locks, I think Mac even also probably has right. some too. And um, I forget the, the International Airline Security sort of commission or standard. Um, but anyway, the, there's a certain lock. Um, I think they just have a special standard. key that the transport exactly. guys have. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Uh, that are able to do it. So, yeah, cool. um, Continue. super handy. Yeah, so I will uh, just continue. I've got a couple more slides to show uh, that are hopefully sort of somewhat fun. Um, I guess also in sort of the behind the scenes, I thought it'd be kind of fun to show, uh, despite all the organized prep that I kind of do ahead of time, um, what ends up happening on shoots, whether like this here, I'm in the bunk of a sailboat, uh, you know, or you might be in whatever setting. I'm sure these are familiar to, you know, people like whether you're traveling or whatnot, back of a car. Um, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, out on this is at Franklin Island in Georgian Bay. I was doing a shoot for uh, Mech actually. Um, this is one of my Ontario tourism ones. This was my DIT media backup station. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, this is how we transported gear on one of our shoots. Um, this is another way we transported gear on another shoot. Um, and so I guess the, the point is like, despite all the organization and everything um i've just it's kind of interesting i don't want to make it seem like you have to be so rigid and hardened and you know uh everything has to go back exactly the way it does like i think i'm a big believer of this idea of like creating a really good foundation and structure um which is sort of like that playground analogy i was using create a really good strong box or a playground so that once it's set and once you need to shoot, you could go play in it. And that goes for like everything. And the gear is sort of the same. It's like I start off the shoot with everything super neat and organized. And by the time I get home, it's just like a jumble box of everything. But I really do believe that the prep ahead of time pays off and not to start off jumbled and all that kind of stuff. Right. So. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things go you and I connect on is that we both have a, a big background in the outdoor recreation world. And, uh, you know, when I see a lot of your prep and hear just what you just said there too, it just sounds exactly like a camping trip or like an expedition trip. It's like before you go, yeah. you've got everything like packed, you're doing the top down shot. You're like, I got this, I got that. And by the time you get home, your tent is soaked, you're destroyed, you're filthy. You're just dropping stuff everywhere. You don't know where anything is anymore. Um, you know, so it seems like a lot of your uh, professional work, that aesthetic or that that um, that way of working comes from the years that you spent doing expeditions and all this sort of stuff that you had to do, uh, you know, in a recreational sense. Yeah, I think I think there is some parallel. I mean, Delina, I've talked about it before in the past of like connecting outdoor mentality uh, with filming. So in the outdoors, like you want to make sure you have food and water and the right warmth so you don't get hypothermia as for your own body's protection. Um, but when you do shoots, and it doesn't always have to be travel and expedition, like it could be for like, you know, a cheese farm out in Ontario. Um, 
you you want to have like the first aid kit for your camera mm -hmm. and for your gear and your equipment and and your team or whatever it is you know like I'll even pack lar bars and uh, there's been times where like Abe who's helped me like I'm starving he had a lar he comes with like everything kitted out so he's he'll give me a lar bar or vice versa um, I don't know it's just a it's just an, a a different way to perceive things I suppose is you know if you're going to go hike a mountain you're going to bring layers and water and food and all that kind of stuff and you're going to prepare to do that right. um, it's the people that don't bring a compass don't bring a GPS that get, have to get helicopter rescued <laughs> um, yeah. and it's just the sort of you know it's there's nothing wrong with thinking that way about shooting uh, whether it's the gear itself or it's actually what you're shooting and, and, and what you're actually going to be filming as well we only got about 10 minutes left and uh, I have a couple of questions that I want to ask you about prep when it comes to the creative so we're going to step away from the gear for a second and, and talk specifically about what the kind of prep you do intellectually um, to make sure that your projects work uh, but before we do we got a couple of questions that I want to get to um, another one from Ray Chang Ray says um, uh, so how did you do the beer shot in the Sapporo ad? I don't know if you can give us a little bit of a breakdown. I can try to bring a still from that shot up. Oh, um, I mean, I, I, I don't remember the actual technical details. I mean, from the shooting side, uh, uh, you know, I think I was handheld and, and uh, we had some lights and we shot in the factory. And then in terms of like the actual foaming and stuff, uh, yeah, there it is. Um, I think it was a mix, if I recall, I'd have to ask Courtney, it was like a mix of using a blender um, with, I think the straw, the straw came in because, the, oh yeah, the blender would create the foam and then you would pour the foam on top. And if it was too much or too little, you'd have to use a straw to suck it out or suck it in. And then... There was some other technique used to make sure that there was carbonation and bubbles inside too. So, yeah, I, I don't remember the exact details. I apologize on that on that, on that one. Um, uh, that's awesome. Uh, and then one from Paul Ninson. Paul says, hello, Go. I am really inspired by your work. Please keep posting BTS. See, people want it, Go. Uh, it's my way of learning from you. Can you talk about personal projects and how over the years those personal projects helped you build your style? Uh, yeah. How they built my style. I mean, I think it's a good question. Uh, it, it's hard. It's somewhat something I did consciously early on. I think like the canoe and, uh, I did another one earlier called pole, which is a dog sledding one at those times. I just, I just wanted to do stories that were interesting, that meant something to me that, um, also had a sense of beauty to it. And it was a little bit more simpler and then I guess things evolved I wanted to kind of break off like lure the north I did want to show a little bit of struggle and pain and that arc of arc arc of that struggle the, the daily grind and the struggle in that sort of experience um, the latest project I'm working worked on in Africa um, I did want to expand the technical side of things and and you know I, I, I worked hard at sort of first time using a, a tilt arm uh, to be able to hang a camera remotely off off the front of a car, um, but I also wanted to go deeper into the story as well. And I don't know; it, it's a hard thing to say consciously. I have to admit it; it's sort of like a natural progression. I I didn't want to just do another canoe. I didn't want to just co continuously do things, and that's I think that's part of my own just sort of personality uh, of 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 wanting to try something different every time, uh, which I guess a lot of people do. Um, and and but by in doing that, I kind of find ways to do that from technical and story approach. Um, yeah. And and so, I mean, man, I could we could take this for another hour. Uh, but before we, you know, have to wrap this up, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, when we're looking at it, whether this is a personal project or a commercial project, because I know that commercial projects have much quicker turnarounds, and you don't get as much time to prep typically. But um, from a creative perspective, um, I'm curious about two things. One is, um, what does creative prep look like for you? Um, you know, how much are you producing uh, in terms of how much phone calls are you making? How much internet research are you doing? Where the genesis of the ideas are coming from? Where you're pulling from? So all the stuff that happens within your own head and the stuff that you physically have to do as the director, 
But also, as sort of a part two to that, if you can remember this after you've answered this question, is what role does your partnership with your wife play in prep um, and in the whole process as well? And having, whether in your case it's a romantic colleague, uh, but, but having somebody as well, some type of partner to help you in your prep and throughout production, if you can speak to those two things. Yeah, so uh, the first part, um, it'll be sort of a continuation of the last question, is the stories, you know, I mentioned early on in the canoe, I just wanted to do something intuitively of, of that feeling of adventure and travel and beauty. Now I actually, um, uh, I'm starting to log notes of feelings and themes and st sort of, yeah, I guess things that I want to express. Um, and so I kind of have a bank of those saved up. And whether it's sort of a personal project or even a commercial project, I kind of look through that bank um, because I want to make some sort of connection to something personal whenever I can. Um, and then that sort of mentality of like keeping a bank of ideas goes with even uh, references. So like most people, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and I'm constantly watching other people's works and a ton of people in Canada, North America, around the world I admire. And I look at their works and I usually save them either on Facebook or on Instagram. Um, I bookmark them and I take screenshots and I have a whole catalog of references so anytime I have a new idea, the first thing I do will be that I go through that catalog of references um, and I pull out the ones that I, I think will feel right for the project, the story, my idea. Um, and that's sort of my starting ground for, for how I do it. And, and, and you know, kind of like the way that my packing of my gear is methodical and organized um, or the way that I sent you my photos for, for this presentation. Uh, yeah, I guess there's some weird... Uh, strength in organization and, and having those libraries and banks that I find that kind of are the impetus and the seeds of my creativity. Um, and then the second part of your question, Dale, with my wife. Um, it, yeah, it's interesting. I think she comes into play in two ways, like on a commercial job, especially she works as a line producer primarily. So uh, obviously it comes to like logistics and resources and budget allocations and the organizing of the shoot. Uh, when it comes to personal projects, um, the thing that I find the most helpful is like this la latest project in Africa. Uh, you know, I was coming up with the idea, I was formulating the idea even on, and I remember we were on the plane heading to Kenya and I was building out the shot list and, and fleshing it out. And I still couldn't wrap my head around exactly what I wanted to say. And I had a whole notepad of notes. And I just, on the plane, we were about to take off. And I remember just going with her. And I think it only took 10 minutes. But in that 10 minutes of going back and forth with her, um, it helps solidify, you know, what I wanted to say. And I think that's been the be biggest benefit of having, having her from a creative standpoint. So. Uh, we got a few other questions here as well. But thank you by sure. that, for that. Uh, and my apologies to everyone listening. Uh, I forgot to turn my furnace off, so uh, sorry for that in the background. Um, so we got a question here from uh, Dimitris. Uh, he says, hey, Go, what are the key elements that you look for in a story when you are researching and pre-producing? The key elements. Um, you know... Uh, I guess I can get technical and say things like, uh, first and foremost, actually funny enough is the cinematography or like the, the, the look of it is, is something that draws my attention right away. But honestly, at the end of the day, it's just whether I feel something or not. Um, like I don't, I don't downplay things that are shot on, you know, black magic cameras or Sony A7s or, or iPhones even like, especially now with all the stuff that's coming out during, during COVID, um, uh, I think I think most people know when you feel something, and that feeling is is what I look for, and that's what makes me put it into a bookmark or a reference pile and whatnot like that. Very cool. Uh, well, we got to wrap this up. I'm sad to wrap this up because man, we have so much other stuff. We actually didn't get a chance to even show the uh, tilt -to arm on the on the truck, um, you know, and, and having to build all that out. Yeah. Was that um, so? Anyways, I was going to go off on a tangent. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, I got into a, a, I was out adventuring in the city. I was, I was doing an errand on my bike and I got, uh, I got whacked by a car, unfortunately. <laughs> and luck, luckily, the, it was just my wrist. You know, out, out of all these photos that you've seen up north in Africa, I've, I've never had a, 
broken bone, and this is my first cast I've ever had was was a, a bike in Toronto. You should have told so. me you were wrestling a bear. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> would have would have made for a good story, but uh, but yeah. Um, thanks everyone for listening, and and I hope in some way that uh, it was helpful. And um, yeah, I appreciate it. Dale. Awesome, thanks so much. That was super fun. Really appreciate it. Uh, best of luck to you this year, and uh, I'm looking forward to, as we all are, uh, more projects from you. So thanks so much for taking the time.